Hello everyone, I'm Klaus from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Designs in Computer Science. Topic 7, Factorial Design. In this video we're going to talk about block design, so let's get going. So until now we have studied the following situation. One input factor, for example the algorithm type, one response variable, for example the solution speed, and a homogeneous experimental condition. What does this mean? When I say homogeneous experimental condition, I mean that the experiment environment is guaranteed to be the same for all observations and there are no significant error sources. So for instance, if you're running the algorithm in the same computer, on the same system, under the same load, with the same data, the, C the condition is homogeneous and every time you run, you expect, the uh, uh, besides the change in the algorithm, you expect everything else to be the same. Of course, it's not exactly the same. The load of the computer changes a little bit. There are some random factors, but you don't expect to be any major factors that affect your experiment. In this situation, we execute the experiment in random order to guarantee that any error sources are equally distributed. So for instance, let's say that we are comparing three different algorithms and we are going to repeat each algorithm 20 times. So there are 60 runs, and when we are executing the, executing the runs to guarantee fairness, we randomize which algorithm we execute at each run. This is called completely randomized design. Now, there are, thinking about all the factors, and the uh, idea for this class is to think about more than two, more than one factors there is something that we call noise or nuisance factors. Noise or noise factors are input variables that can have a significant impact in the experiment output, but they are not relevant to the scientific question that we want to ask. In a previous lecture, we discussed the use of pairing to remove the effect of one noise factor. factor. Blocking is a generalization of the pair design approach for multiple noise factors. So what's the difference between block design and completely randomized design that we talked about? We use the randomization, the CRD, to prevent the effect of unknown noise factors in our experiment. On the other hand, we use blocking or pairing if we only have one noise factor when we know from the beginning that certain factors affect the output variable, but for some reason we are not interested in their effects. Let me give you an example. Let's say that a student decides to compare a standard optimization algorithm against size variants, to, uh, seven, six variants, sorry, not size, six variants, to solve a certain family of vehicle routing problems, VRPs. Now, the student wants to know if any variant returns a systematically lower cost value when applied to 180 problem distance. So there are 180 different problems of VRP. Now, when he analyzes the problems, the student detects that these problems, they can be divided in 36 groups with five problems in each group. So we have 180 VRP problems, but there are different groups with different characteristics. And the student detected 36 groups and each group had six problems. Now, if we think about the experiment design variables, we have confidence, the power and the minimum interesting effect that the student wants to use. And in this problem, first, let's identify the variables of interest. Now, the input factor are the algorithms, and the levels is the original of algorithm and six variants. Now, the return variable is the cost of the algorithm, and the levels are the integer value of the cost. Finally, we have the noise factor, which is the instance types, and the levels are the 36 different instance types that we have. In this situation, if we employ a completely randomized design, which means that we ignore the effect of the instance type, the difference in result among instance types will have an effect in the residual, in the result, and possibly mask the difference between algorithms. To avoid this, what we do is that we organize the experiment in 36 blocks, one block for each problem type. And then we randomize the execution of all seven algorithms inside each block. So all seven algorithms, we will run all algorithms in all blocks, but inside each block, we apply randomization. 
This is what we call the randomized complete block design. We have one block for each, fa for each factor level and we run all algorithms in each block randomly. Now, the RCBD assumes some characteristics above the experiments that we have to make sure they exist before we apply this technique. First is one replicate per block, which means that for each algorithm, we're going to run the we're going to have one data point for that algorithm in that block. Now, this data point can be aggregated. That's what I'm going to talk about in the next in the next slide. Now, that's very important. The blocks are independent. You have to guarantee that really uh, each level in the blocked factor is independent from the others. It's different from the others. Also, randomization inside the blocks is independent. So inside the blocks, you have to guarantee there is no relationship between randomized runs. These assumptions are really important. If we fail to guarantee, for example, the independence between the blocks, uh, then we introduce something called pseudo-replication, which may result in inflation of type 1 error. A very simple example of pseudo-replication is that let's say that we identify 36 types, but we made a mistake. Out of these 36 types, actually six types are identical. They were identified as different by mistake. This means that the six types are not independent. The results should be the same. And we're going to get pseudo-replication that will have an influence in our results. Now, in the algorithm example, we obtain the following experimental data. We have seven algorithm variants and we have 180 total problems with 36 groups, five problems per group. Then we have 30 repetitions per algorithm per instance. So we are running seven algorithms times 30 replications times 180 problems. So we have 37,000 observations total. That's a lot. We are not going to use all of these observations though. First, because we're using a uh, group block design, we, the block design requires one replicate per block. So to satisfy this requirement, we're going to do an aggregation of the data. So the performance of each algorithm per problem is averaged. So instead of using the study repetitions, the study repetitions will reduce the error when we average them. So for each algorithm, we have one, for each pair, each pair of algorithm and problem, we have one data point, which is the average of the study runs. Then the performance of each algorithm per group is also averaged. So for each group, we take the performance of the algorithm in the five problems that compose that group, and we take that average. This gives us a total of 36 observations per algorithm, one observation per block. So this is how we would calculate this aggregation in R. Uh, the data for this example is available on Manaba, so you can apply this code to obtain this 36 aggregation, aggregated observations that I mentioned. And when we visualize that, it's always important before we run the statistical analysis to visualize the data. Here we are doing a uh, plot uh, uh, um, where the y-axis is the cost, is the return variable, and the x-axis are the groups. And when we see on the groups, we can see that the algorithms seem to have a consistent ordering across the groups. Sometimes there are a few changes, but in general, we see that the pink is the one with the highest cost, and the purple seems to be the one with the lowest cost, although for some groups, the brown seems to be the one with the lowest cost. Now, a statistical analysis of the CRBT is similar to the ANOV analysis that we studied in the previous class. Uh, for the derivation of the model, see the link for Campello that has the full derivation of this model. We're going to just see the summary of the analysis here. Note that the number of observations is based on the number of blocks. This is very important. And the number of treatment levels. So here we have an ANOV plot model, which is treatment plus blocks. This plus indicates that this is a additive additive model. So our model is an analysis of various model of Y by algorithm times instance group. And the data is the data that we calculated. And when we see the summary of the model, we have the information and we see that um, the, uh, the ANOVA here indicates that there seems to be a significant value 
for the algorithm, a significant effect for the algorithm, and also for the group. And of course, it's obvious that there is a significant effect for the group. We can see here in this image versus this group is very different from the others. So this is kind of obvious. But we see also that there is a significant effect for the algorithm as well. And this is what we are interested in. Now, we can do some extra analysis to verify the uh, how the residuals look like and we can see here that there are some outliers in the residuals when we do the qq plot this is also shown here when we plot the residuals against the against a linear uh, a linear regression and we can see that there are some residuals the same ones that are a um over over uh some <clears throat> some extreme values here we can see the here so we might want to do maybe a transformation of the data to try to reduce the influence of these um, outliers we can also look at the very vari the variance and we can see that the variance across all factor levels seems to be about the same so we don't have to worry about the variance for the ANOVA here so analysis of the residual showed some irregularities. So we apply log transformation. So here we are applying log transformation and we still see a significant effect on the uh, blocks and a significant effect on the algorithms. So when we look at this, we still have uh, the effect of some outliers, but it's much lesser. You can see that the, the outliers here, it's, a very, it's much smaller than the outliers here. So we got small and we also get a better distribution of the fitted curve. So this seems that the log transformation has helped uh, normalizing the data, regularizing the data. Now the post hoc analysis of the CRBD follows the same principles of the post hoc analysis of the ANOVA. So I recommend that you look back at the ANOVA chapter to see how do we do the post hoc analysis. Now, the type and number of comparisons need to be defined a priori. In this case, because we're comparing an original algorithm against all the old against six variations, it makes sense to use a one against all, where the one is the original and always the others, to try to find out which of the variants have a significant difference from the original. The number of observations is based on the number of blocks. So here, the number of observations that we used for our statistics, for calculating power, etc., is the number of blocks. Alpha correction of the pair observations is also applied as necessary, also based on the number of blocks. Now, you should do further reading for these two models that are closely related to the CRBD. For instance, the incomplete block design is what we do when some of the observations, some of the blocks, are missing. Uh, in this case, it doesn't make a lot of sense for the sense of the algorithm because you can run for everyone. But if you are using some blocks that you cannot make observations for all the treatments in all the blocks, you want to use an incomplete block design. A generalized block design is what you do when each block has multiple replicates. So the generalized block design has some uh, techniques to reduce the, the effects of uh, pseudo replication. Both of these are just the small changes to the complete random block design. So I recommend you look up on the internet if your uh, experiment design requires using one of these blocking approaches. In the next video, we're going to talk about factorial design. So see you there.